For my latest adventure, I did something a little different. And I strapped on the racing gear, fireproof racing gear, and it was terrifying. We've been talking about doing it in the same way that groups of guys in their 20s would talk about going to Vegas to you know, gamble away the night or going to strip clubs or doing stuff like that. We always talked about doing lemons. If anyone are race fans out there, you'll recall that there is a race called 24 Hours at Le Mans. It takes place in Le Mans, France. Supercars from all around the world go and compete for 24 hours. They have a, usually a, a team of four drivers. They switch in and out uh, throughout the night. This was 24 hours of lemons. The way it works in our group is we'd come up with these great ideas, great ideas, but the follow through just wasn't there. And this year, sick of it, I dragged us to do it, leading us to the final day for signups in which we realized that half of our group wouldn't be able to do it. I talked to Ryan Layton, whom I had worked with at the Booth Bay Register. And I was the poor schmuck that came in here with an orange fireproof suit that didn't even fit me. I don't know how to drive like in a race ever. So uh, we had that going for us. So if you can imagine a hundred or more cars all vying for a top position on this little narrow go-kart course with hills and banks and places you can wipe out and catch on fire. It's a thrilling place. This was more like a bunch of drunken bees fighting over a bean inside of a can. Drive on the mass turnpike for a day and you'll get a good idea. Just add uh, methamphetamines and uh, ring dings. <laughs> I'm kidding about the methamphetamines. Maybe. My nickname among my friends at home is Captain Slow. The fastest I've ever been in a car was a little over 100 miles an hour, which is terrifying. I am, in terms of driving, glacial. We've never stepped foot on the racetrack. We were totally green. I once uh, did a pretty sweet downshift in front of some teenagers up at the high school. It made me feel pretty cool. I get intimidated in three lanes of traffic. Hello. Drew is the guy that uh, put together the whole thing. He set up the entire race for us. He uh, made sure everything was there. He was the captain. Drew, who's Italian, he says that that means something in the racing world. It doesn't. He just likes to wear red and reference Italian stuff. How's my hair? Other people on the team, there was Larry. When I emailed Larry about the race, I, I just, you know, email, would you be interested in this and, and would Brian be too? Larry, Brian's Larry's son. And uh, five minute response, uh, yes, and I have the car. Out of the six people on the team, only one of us has actually raced a car. <laughs> That would be Doug Tabbitt. Doug Tabbitt and I go back a long way. We grew up together in Booth Bay Harbor. That guy races, he's a racer. Doug's condition was that we have a mechanic and the car is a standard. So we now had a team of six when we only needed four and we had a mechanic. Um, I lied about the mechanic part. We were set to go. We had ourselves a team.
car we were racing was a 1999 Mercury Tracer. It had 1.2 liters of fury. Stock suspension. Dual overhead cams. It meant that the bottom was, I'd say, made out of rust and held together with hopes. I also want to mention that we had snow tires. And we didn't even take the snow tires off for the race. The hardest part about racing on snow tires? Now the roll cage, the roll cage was the one area where we got serious. Instead of it being two that go straight across to protect a you know, side impact, it was a cage. It was, it was four across and four up and down. So if things did go wrong, you know, oh well, we'd be all right. So to actually get accepted to 24 Hours of Lemons, and you do need to be accepted, believe it or not, you need to have a good theme. To see like some of the cars that were in there and some of the themes. There were Volkswagens, Audis, BMWs, Alfa Romeos, Porsches, even a Peugeot. <laughs> Peugeot. Most other cars have really elaborate schemes and colors and themes. There's cars painted like the British flag, the American flag. Donald Trump is very popular with the Lemons crowd. There were a lot of race cars underneath junk cars. Your imagination in $500 is the limit because everyone cheats. There was a Toyota MR2 that had a van again body welded to the outside and they raced that thing around. The other car that really made some, uh, made a splash I should say, is the General Lee Fabulous. Which was a Volkswagen Beetle dressed up to look like a gay pride parade. I, and I hope there are more motorsports that are that accepting. I had thought racing was, excuse my term, mainly a redneck sport, but it's way more involved than that. There's just so many walks of life that actually uh, are big race fans, and I felt like the outsider. I got the feeling that the Lemons race was uh, a bunch of people not taking it so seriously. I was wrong about that. So I get there and I ask the guys, so you've done this before, right? Like you guys have been on track before? I just get blank stares. So none of you guys have ever been on track ever before. I don't think Doug was exactly expecting us. And I ask him, you guys have different tires, right? I said, yeah. Like, yeah, but different ones, like race tires, right? No, no, just another set of these. I don't think Doug expected snow tires, no, but uh, he seemed very uh, open to being helpful. When we were rolling up to the inspection line, and it is, you know, the gauntlet of chirping. Everybody that walks by, those are your tires? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good luck. We got there, the guy's looking it over, and he didn't really pick it apart that much. He didn't look under the car, which was a good thing, because the under of the car was falling apart. Plastic, rubber, or anything like that, it's gotta be metal, no, it's gotta be a battery. Okay. The only thing you need to fix. He said, you passed everything except uh, the battery hold down. He didn't like the factory one, so we had to build a metal one. We went to the BS line, which is where they judge your car, your theme. By the end of the day, you can't tell what people are racing because they've transformed them into something else. Our theme, our car looked like we just kind of brought one and painted numbers on it. If, if you had to like apply a strategy, it would have been like a sleeper. It didn't really attract any attention except it was slow. But so the night of the race, we decided to make her look mean. Ben got on the, uh, the dinosaur attachment. I usually carry around a couple of extra dinosaurs with me because I tend to get a little bored. Doug started tearing the windows out of the car. I think that probably gave him a feeling of productivity in an otherwise uh, uneasy situation. I just, I saw the outcome of this race. I'm going, this is going to be ridiculous. I got butterflies in my stomach. 
adrenaline was just going through me. You hear the sounds and you're on the track, it's a race. And you're in a race car. The idea is not only are you supposed to go really fast and vie for the number one position, but you're also supposed to keep your car running, or at least try to. It didn't stutter, it didn't skip, it, it didn't pop, it just ran. First session out, cook the brake pads. We never change the brake pads on the car. Yeah, this is uh, left turns. So a lot of the things that you would normally do to a car before you, you know, drove it as hard as you could for 16 hours, I didn't really do. <laughs> oh boy. I ended up uh, changing the brake pads. We made an emergency run to the auto zone, grabbed some brake pads, and that took us out for about two hours. But so we get the brake pads in, and when they put you in, they strap you down. Straps come around you in all directions. It is like NASA was strapping me into a rocket ship. You can't breathe to begin with because you're nervous, but now you really can't breathe because you're strapped into this, you know, 1998 Mercury Tracer. And that first part, it's in the long straightaway, and the entire time it's like, don't go towards the light, just keep driving towards the track and you're thinking about it. It's like, what did I do wrong in my life to wind up strapped to a 1998 Mercury Tracer about to go out and do battle with all manners of Volkswagen GTIs? Other cars were smashing and, and hitting each other. I was actually taking bets with myself as to which one of the guys would wreck the car first. My money was on Ryan. Knowing how my luck is, I would be the guy that flips the car within the last lap. But so I actually missed the exit for getting onto the track. And normally, they give you enough time to get up to speed so that you don't get run over. However, I entered my first race going 15 miles an hour and if there were horns, that was all I would have heard. I had never thought that I would say this, but that Miata was terrifying. The Miata? A Miata. Uh, the sound of that ferocious little <laughs> four banger will haunt the rest of my days. Oh my God, it's so scary. It's the only thing I can compare it to is Mad Max meets go-karting, a little bit of Mario Kart, and just a little bit of pee. Our goal, the first day, besides not ruining our own day, was to not ruin someone else's. Whether you're roughhousing, you hit something, or you're just acting or driving erratically, you're gonna get a black flag and you're gonna get penalized. I remember one of the pit crew wrenching out a cone out of the wheel well in which the car had hit. Once they took it out, they were forced to weld the cone on top of the roof. At the end of the first day, we all had kind of learned, like, okay, this is what racing is. We somehow did it. Uh, I don't think anybody had any less fear than anybody else. When you do something like that where there is extreme experience together, you have to bond. I'm not going to say it was more intense than the military, but I'm going to say it was close. It wasn't. It wasn't close. Doug, how do you feel today about uh, racing? How's your confidence level in this beast? Well, I'm praying for snow. drove like maniacs. So day two was rain. Day two started wet. We knew that it would. Today you jab the brakes and you might be around. The second day we went out for blood. We were passing cars. We were taking turns way too fast. We shredded the outside of our snow tires off. If you make a lot of laps, you're gonna beat the people that can't. If you wanna pass us, you gotta get past.
past us. First day, we would only do pit changes in the garage because we were embarrassed. By the end of the second day, we were doing pit changes out on pit row, where it had taken us five, six, seven minutes. You're we doing it in a minute and a half. Ben got rid of that fear that haunted us. And then Ben started making laps. Because I was just raring. I ran into a giant pink Buick painted to look like a pig. Instead of being cautious, we became the enraged madmen of a Mercury T racer. You know, we took on that Velociraptor blood. We did not do well. Tires are hurting, the brakes are fading. So take more time than you need. When you're going, you know that turn, the hairpin? When you see the yellow line, start on the brakes. When I saw um, Brian uh, get in the car after Ben got out, I looked at the tires and the fronts were just peeling. We were just running as hard as we could. Brian, uh, Larry's son, he was just kicking butt on the course. He was, he was matching lap times with Doug. And we were just watching Positions tick away as we kept on running and running and running. Every lap you're like, how is this thing still on the road? I really enjoyed our uh, reliability. So I had a lot of pressure um, on me. I'd be finishing the race. Mind you, if we could finish the race. What it came down to, this basic strategy of racing, is uh, being smooth. Ryan took it smooth and, you know, it, I don't know if, if anybody else could have kind of had that patience with the car. The clouds are clearing and the sun came out and I started to get a little sentimental. I got a little, um, it was it was poignant moment for me and I was just like, you know what, I really love this car. I, I really do. I'm going to miss this car. And it wasn't because we were passing a lot of cars on the track, it was because we put the time in. It was surprisingly quiet going around the track. The loud clatter of snow tires on pavement. As the laps kept going and going and the time kept going down, I was, I was gonna head towards the checkered flag. Uh, we finished 71st, but we finished the race. And we all improved our times. I don't think I've felt more like part of a group of, of strangers that I don't know in any other situation. Me and Drew, and me and Ryan, and Ryan and Doug, and Larry and Brian, we all came together and we were the head gasculous horseymen. Old oil, old brake pads, snow tires, and we raced 14 hours without dying is, is a miracle. What we know now, we went into it with the right strategy look like you don't belong there. And if we can do that and have a car that might be fast and drive it better, uh, we might even kind of beat somebody. This was, uh, what, end of October? We could have actually had uh, snow on the track, and if we did, you know, we would have won, if so facto. So, it was about 20 degrees outside, and I searched my car frantically all night for this ID, mainly because I wanted a beer. I needed it to race, I needed to have a valid driver's license, so I was freaking out, just my luck. Ryan couldn't find his license, and he tore apart his car, like, tore it apart. More. He tore apart his car more than you did with the Tracer. That's true. I had found pocket lint. I found work boots, which I didn't know were in there, but I found them, so now I have a new pair of work boots. I found Pop-Tarts from my camping trips. I found magazines like Golf Digest, which I'm embarrassed to admit I had in my car. Golf Digest. 
So my dad actually managed to make it down for the race, and he, eventually, about halfway through, he stopped rooting for the head gasketless horseman and started rooting for the car called Mr. Fister, which had a fist protruding from the front. I'm not. I'm just gonna say no comment on Mr. Fister. It was a little worrying how much he started to enjoy the Mr. Fister mobile. Racing like a beast, we called him Danger Doug. Kind of like highway to the danger zone. So, Ben was the original captain. Right. And then I said, I want to be captain. Because you're like that. So, so people say that Drew looks like Jeff Goldblum, his <gasps> third cousin, and I look like Chris Pratt's third cousin. Oh. And so when we're together, we're, we're the Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. You're not ready for a tracer. <laughs> I was born in the tree center. <laughs>